Hi, and welcome to another edition of Inside Surrey. I'm Diane Fraser. And I'm Rick DeBanks. We've made a few changes here in 95. The show's got a whole new look, a new attitude, and lots and lots of information. Here's what we're going to look at in the next half hour. The city of Surrey was stunned by the abduction and murder of Melanie Carpenter. Citizens were outraged and wanted to help in any way they could. On somewhat of a lighter note, recycling is an important part of our daily lives. Recycling paint is another way we can help. Live theater in a hotel, the White Rock players come to South Surrey. A Surrey elementary school turns 50. And our Chinese community celebrates the Year of the Pig. We'll also take a look at whether violent crime is as common as it seems. And we asked you if you thought Surrey was an unsafe place to live. And finally, Todd Stewart brings us all the sports scores and highlights. The death of Melanie Carpenter has touched us all. Days after her disappearance, people from the community gathered at a candlelight service at Frank Hurt Senior Secondary, the school Melanie graduated from. All attending prayed that she would soon be home. I saw Melanie take her first breath when she was born. I was there in the delivery room, and I don't want to be around to see her take her last, and let's hope that hasn't happened. In fact, we believe that hasn't happened. I don't really know what to say, but if my sister can hear us right now, I'd just like to tell her that I love her, and no matter what happens, She's always my sister and I always love her. I just, I don't know what else to say. Thank you very much. I'm just going to let my balloon go. Bring my money home. Surrey firefighters have a tradition of community service and support that was brought home once again when they organized a car wash at Queen Elizabeth Senior Secondary to raise funds for the Melanie Carpenter Trust. A school parking lot seems like a funny place for a car wash, especially in the pouring rain. But the feeling in the community generated by the death of Melanie Carpenter was such that cars were lined up even before the firemen had finished setting up. It was clear that people needed to do something. Some came just to donate funds and to pass on words of praise for the effort. Firemen were also collecting signatures on a petition to send to Ottawa to change the legislation regarding early release of dangerous offenders. The response was indeed overwhelming for all those involved. Ten people were lined up. Just as we were still setting up, people were lined up to come in. It was just great. We weren't sure what the bad weather how it would be, but uh, the support was great. You can know, see the line up now. Because of the massive effort, the Melanie Carpenter Fund was running out of money, but thankfully not support. The Comedy Cave in Surrey decided to raise money, donating all the proceeds to the foundation. There were unsubstantiated rumors that Robin Williams might show up, but it was Melanie that everyone came for. Here's a little hint for you. You never, you never want to get another speeding ticket as long as you live? Go out tomorrow and do this. Go out tomorrow and buy a cellular phone. The next time the cops pull you over for speeding, pick up the phone and dial 911 and report an armed robbery two blocks away. <laughs> Philadelphia and Washington 
in Canada, this is a towel rack to dry our hands on. We don't need warning signs on our towel racks, do we? No. How many gas stations in Vancouver, Washington, they got a warning sign? Warning, do not attempt to stick head through loop or hang from towel. I think it, uh, it took, um you know, the whole entire Pacific Northwest and all of Canada, you know, to rally behind it. I was sitting in my house on a Sunday night and watching TV and Steve had come on and said the, the fund was uh, uh, running out of money and this was when the, the, the hunt was really on and, and being a club owner, not only in Surrey, but uh, I had a venue where I could uh, raise a tremendous amount of money in a short period of time to help out the fund and uh, Monday morning, first thing I did quarter after eight is I phoned Steve and said, look, uh, you know, I, I own the comedy cave here in Surrey. I'd like to put on a benefit to help raise money to support the cause and uh, he was 110% right behind it from the get-go. I can't believe the support that you guys are down here tonight and given us and, and through this whole thing from the public. And a couple of things I want to say and then I'll get off of the show. Um, we're going to take this this fight and we're going to take it a long way. In fact, we're going to take it as far as we can and we're not going to quit until we change. Thank you. Uh, we just wanted to stop by this evening uh, on behalf of the Lions Football Club uh, to let the Carpenter family know that we're all behind you. And we brought a 1995 Grey Cup jersey along this evening. Yeah. 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 All of us that are here this evening signed this. We had a couple of the cheerleaders sign it as well. It'll be in the back and uh, it'll be up for auction and all the money will go towards the fund. So. Throughout the Lower Mainland, so many people became deeply affected by the loss of Melanie. Steve Carpenter allowed all of those who shared his grief to say goodbye. Over 4,000 people attended the service at the Pacific Coliseum, and as Steve Carpenter said, Melanie became Canada's daughter. And I promise you, Melanie, we will never forget you, and we won't let your death be in vain. Thank you very much. I'm really going to miss her. I'm never going to forget her. And I'm always going to love her. And I know that she'll always be with me wherever I go. She's safe now, she'll be with me always. And she's safe inside of me, you know, her soul inside of me. I loved her more than, more than life itself. And I miss her. What I say, it's, it's merely words. And words can't express the, the love that Melanie and I shared. Seeing sunny days that I thought would never end. I've seen the only times when I could not find a friend. But I always thought that I'd see you, baby. Todd Stewart and I went to school with Melanie, and we can tell you from experience, you couldn't ask to meet a nicer person. All of us here at Inside Surrey would really like to wish our sincerest condolences to the Carpenter family. On a lighter note, recycling has become part of our daily lives. As we begin to realize we live in a planet of limited resources, recycling paint is another way we can help. Over 2,000 people in a two-day period came to Bear Creek Park to safely dispose of their unwanted paint. With the success of this pilot project, we can look forward to more in the future. I should have grabbed some of that paint to redo my shed. 
Inspiration is often found in stories that relay a message about personal growth in the face of difficult circumstances. The play Educating Rita is one of these stories. The Pacific Inn on the King George Highway in White Rock may not be a theater, but it is the home of the White Rock Players' next production, Educating Rita. We sat in on the rehearsals and had a chance to talk with the actors about the play and their roles. It's, uh, it's the story of uh, two people. One is uh, uh, an English professor who's an alcoholic, uh, who is uh, really somewhat bored uh, with his life. Uh, and uh, Rita, who comes in, really is a housewife who's dissatisfied with her life and wants to do something more. Uh, and throughout the play, you see, to some extent, uh, the decline and fall of Frank, correspondingly, as you might say, pari passu, with the rise and blossoming of, uh, of Rita. The role of Frank, the English professor, comes naturally for this native of Britain. Uh, this is the, uh, my first uh, lead role. I've done uh, other relatively minor characters uh, in the White Rock Playhouse, and uh, uh, one has to uh, take the big jump one day, and uh, this seemed to be a reasonable uh, thing for me to do. Some of the things I've done before have been uh, kind of a caricature of myself, and perhaps this play itself is uh, partially a caricature of, uh, of part of me. Rita is the central character of the play, and the actor describes the Pygmalion-like changes that occur in her character. She grows completely from the very beginning to the end, uh, in regards to right f from outward appearance to inside. She, her, her, she calls herself Rita, her real name is Susan, and then finally in the end she goes back to her real name, and it's just um, basically a message of being happy with who you are inside and not being afraid to explore those limits. I want them to come away with knowing that they can do anything they want to do and that don't ever listen to anybody say, oh, you can't do that or it's too tough or maybe you won't be able to make it or you might not be able to do, do that career choice because everyone is given a wish and you have the power to make it come true. Educating Rita opens February 9th. For ticket information, call the White Rock Playhouse Theatre box office at 536-8333. For Front Row Center, I'm Diane Fraser. I don't smoke. I made a promise not to. Well, I won't tell anyone. Present students and graduates of David Brinken Elementary celebrated the 50th anniversary of the school, which opened January 25th, 1945. Close to 500 people attended a gala evening in the school gym. Exhibits were designed to remind people what life was like in 1945. We're glad to be here together to celebrate the 50th anniversary of David Branken School. Today is the school's 50th birthday. 50 years ago, January 26, 1945, the school opened up here in Surrey School District. So today is our opportunity to celebrate those 50 years, and by the looks of today's attendance, everybody has enjoyed themselves. The intent was to give people a sense of what it was like in 1945, so the exhibits in the various classrooms depict things which you would normally see in or around 1945. We had an opportunity to drop into the Surrey Arts Center to help celebrate the Year of the Pig with the members of our Chinese community. Exhibits of Chinese calligraphy and painting, among the other arts, crafts, and food displays, gave us a small look into the inside of Chinese culture. Thank you. 
Well, try to figure out what that means. Too often we pick up the papers and read about someone getting murdered, raped, or abducted. We may begin to feel that no one is safe to walk the streets at night, or even during the day. The question that must then be looked at is whether we are really living in a violent society. Um, in the Yale Hope area, two hikers found, at that time, an unidentified body in a sleeping bag. Okay. Um, after talking to Corporal Henley this morning, he went up there this morning and he confirmed that it is my daughter, Melanie. Surrey's reputation for violence has not been improved in the minds of the public with the recent abduction and murder of Melanie Carpenter. Three weeks of agonizing by her family and friends ended when her body was found near Yale. It left many of us wondering what has happened to our society. It's getting worse every month that some little girl getting raped or killed, or a little boy. But mostly little girls are women. It's just not safe for women on the streets anymore. 1993 statistics show Surrey, among cities of similar size, as having the third highest violent crime rate. Violent offenses range from murder and assault to abduction and robbery. These are the types of crime most often reported and sensationalized by the media. As a consequence, we tend to focus our attention on the more infrequent but more heinous type of crimes. And then when the word or the category crime comes up, that's what people think about. Violent crime has doubled since 1978 with assault charges counting for a large portion of this increase. But can we really say for sure that violent crime has gone up or down? You know, there's not a police officer you talk to who isn't going to tell you the majority of crime is not violent. You know, we're looking at somewhere around 8% of the crimes that come to the attention of the criminal justice system are actually crimes of violence. Increasing the number of people in the police departments has the, you know, unwitting outcome, if you like, the unintended consequence of actually increasing the number of crimes that get uh, funneled through the justice system. Um, if it didn't, then I guess we would all have to sit back and say, well, our money's been wasted. Crime rates have not gone down, you know, officially, you know, and they won't. They won't go down as long as the police keep hiring more and more personnel. They'll only go up. Additional police is not the complete answer to combating violent crime. We have to take a look at our present justice system. The uh, justice system and the police aren't working hand in hand. Uh, the police uh, have all the necessary tools and the skills to look after uh, communities, but uh, when, when it gets into the courtroom, it isn't being dealt with properly. There has been a number of uh, investigative strategies that the police community has used in the past that are no longer longer available to us because of decisions that have come out of the Supreme Court of Canada. Uh, our toolbox is getting lighter and consequently it's sometimes is taking more time and more resources to solve a particular offense. Uh, it is my opinion that uh, if you commit a particular type of crime there has to be a, uh, a level of punishment that if you are convicted that you're going to have to serve and do. Uh, if that isn't consistent, then I think the fear of committing a crime is diminished. As Melanie Carpenter becomes another name to add to a tragically growing list, the public is increasing its calls for changes to the justice system. Safety is an issue for everyone. And we asked you how safe you feel in the city of Surrey.
think it's becoming an unsafe place to live because of all the crime that's blooming. It seems to be getting approaching, approaching closer. It seems to be more and more accidents lately that are closer to home. And it seems to be hitting younger people and a lot of women are getting hurt. So as a woman, I don't feel very safe. It's getting to be that way. We've been here since 77. And we don't go to night. We lock our door and we stay in. We're locked in like prisoners. Uh, I, I don't think Surrey is an unsafe place to live. I think there's certain elements here that are unsafe and uh, the problem is the law doesn't have the teeth to, um, to handle it. Uh, I think the, uh, the uh, justice system and the police aren't working hand in hand. I don't think it's any um, unsafer than any other part of Canada. I think these things are happening all over. And I think the laws have to be changed. Uh, people that are dangerous like that should not be allowed out. Um, that mandatory release that um, the, um, Melanie's murderer um, got, that law has to be changed. It's wrong. I think this world is an unsafe place to live. It doesn't matter where it is. It just happened in Surrey. It could happen anywhere. Everybody has to be careful. So, that's the word on the street. Another new feature on Inside Surrey is our sports report. Tad Stewart will be regularly updating us on what sporting events are happening around town. And here he is now with all his sports scores and highlights. NHL talks. Hockey's back. If only our Vancouver Canucks knew about that, though. The lockout ended, and they are still starting very, very slow. Let's hope they pull up their socks for the remaining three months. In BCJHL action... The Surrey Eagles have gone 6-4 and four thus far in January. Key games for Surrey saw the Eagles play host to a prosperous Powell River team. Scoring for Surrey was number 9, Fraser Renard. He had two goals and one assist. Shane Cuss also had three points on the night. Goaltender Jason Wong stopped 30 shots as they skated away with a 3-2 victory. Next up, the Langley Thunder. And they proved why their team is number 1 in the mainland division. As they spanked Surrey 13-6, Jason Lee faced 15 shots before coach Pat Smith yanked him in the second. 18-year-old Wong replaced Lee after seven pucks found the twine. Kyle Knopp, Shane Cuss, Corey Stock, and Peter Cox all had two points each on a losing cause for the penalty-riddled Eagles. Langley captain Jeff Antonovich had a great game, scoring seven points and getting yet another hat-trick on, on the season. Aaron Hoffman also had four helpers on the night. To close out the month, the slapping Surrey Eagles defeated Royal City 14-2 and Chilliwack 5-1, but fell to a Bellingham Icehawks team 7-5. Shane Cuss notched a pair, while Kevin Lee stopped 26 out of 31. Now let's take a look at the mainland division. The powerful Thunder are first place, and the Eagles currently languish in third. This is a very tight division, though, folks. As you can see, Knopp and Cuss are both in the top 10 scoring race, while Antonovich is running away, running away with first overall. Elsewhere in senior men's hockey, the Buccaneers trampled the Knights 15-4. Turning to basketball, now it isn't the NBA, but these kids sure do have a thing for competitive spirits. As the Surrey School Board, with help from the RCMP, put on the fourth annual RCMP High School Basketball Classic. Sixteen teams entered from single A to triple A in a play-down format. When it was all said and done, the Semiamu triple A team faced the Holy Cross Crusader double A team, coached by Johnny Reese. These two teams met at Guilford Park Secondary, where we pick it up. In the first quarter, with Semiamu up 9 to 6. As we can see, Semiamu has a great command of this game. They pass the ball around very nicely. Scott Clute throws up a brick from outside. The rebound is denied, but hey, McMemoyle's up there. He drains it for two. We go to the other end now, where Holy Cross has the ball. Great possession here. They throw it back to the line. He moves in just inside. He gets two. Now we go the other way. Semiamu had a great command of this game. Let me tell you, folks, they were just everywhere. They passed the ball around very nicely and looked like an NBA team. I'm telling you the truth. Scott Clute puts it up here for three. Great basket, Scotty. We see Scott Clute again as he gets a free throw. And he, well, of course, he drains it because he's awesome. <laughs> we see a very dejected crowd here, folks, because, you know, they're all going for Holy Cross. Here we see a semi a great three-way passing play. As they work it from one end of the court to the other end, he puts it up, he misses, but, hey, McMwell's there again. Puts it up for two. We go to the other end now. Lou Chasseur throws it in. He gets it back. He throws it back to the line. It's just outside. McLeod gets it. Three points. 
And now we see uh, Sammy Amu team holding up the trophy as they are victorious 63 to 58. In regular high school basketball action, North Surrey placed third in their tourney at Folden High. Eugene Shaw was the first All-Star. William Beagle Jr. boys jammed their way to the top as they are now 10 and 0 in league play. Glenn, Glenn Kalamusu and Lucky Kara performed well for Beagle. And in senior boys play, Ryan Perry led the high-flying Hornets from Frank Hurt to a great month of hoops. Grade 8 boys single A action saw L.A. Matheson go 3 and 4 this season. And Sammy, don't call me Tony, Montana scored 41 points in a single game and then followed up with two 20-plus point games. Way to go, Sam. And finally, Triple A action, Guilford Park have had an excellent season. They went undefeated at Tamanoas Tournament to finish first overall. Paul Wilson, Harpinder Candola, and Steve Plate all played very well for Guilford Park. The young grapplers from Guilford also played in a Delta Tournament where Sai Luan Kum Dang received first All-Star for his efforts in the playdown. Playoffs are scheduled to start late February. Now diving straight into swimming, some of the best synchronized swimmers have competed in a Regional A routine meet out at the North Surrey Recreation Center. This, the first meet of 1995, will feature members which include Janice Bremner, Susan Cruz, Kathy Glenn, and Christine Larson. The event will also feature a demonstration by the BC team who will be competing in the Alberta Winter Games. Now in soccer, coach Rob Lowther took his girls to the first annual indoor soccer tournament where the Burnaby Rangers finished first overall. Now here's my Inside Sports co-anchor, Jason Litico. Be sure to join us next month for all the scores and highlights and be sure to tune in to the best sports action every Friday night at 9 p.m. on Rogers Community 4. Coming up this month, the games will include a matchup of BCJHL Mainland Division opponents Chilliwack taking on the Langley Thunder on Friday, February 10th. Men's College Basketball will be on tap next Friday, February 17th as Trinity Western takes on Douglas College. Triple A Basketball will be on Rogers when Centennial tips off against North Surrey Spartans Friday, February 24th. And our second BCJHL hockey game this month will pick cross-border foes Bellingham Icehawks against our own Surrey Eagles on Friday, March 4th. So join us next month for Inside Sports. I'm Jason Litico. Well, thanks a lot, guys. For even more sports action, check out Locker Room this Sunday at 7. I'll be co-hosting. You know I gave Jason that tie. Great choice there, Rick. So what's next, Diane? Well, that's it for today's show, and we'll be looking forward to seeing you next time. For Inside Surrey, I'm Diane Fraser. And I'm Rick DeBanks. Adios. Arrivederci. Sayonara.